Armor has been around as long as people have been trying to kill each other. But archaeologically speaking, pieces of art and things that represent the human form have been around longer. The depictions of ourself has a long history and it seems to be something that fascinates us to no end. It changes throughout time and it says a lot about the culture that produced it. Artwork of oneself speaks of how they saw themselves, how they would like to be seen, or maybe just what they wanted to get across to an audience. In society, armor is a top to bottom construct. The most important people will be armored first and they'll be armored the best because they're worth protecting or just because they can afford it. <clears throat> Considering this, when a society's technical prowess grows and more people can attain armor, how does an important person set themselves apart from the common person? Perhaps they can be on the cutting edge of armor design, with expertly crafted equipment that protects them to a minutely higher degree. Or maybe they own many components and entire sets of armor. Or perhaps they take the decoration of their armor to an exquisite level, putting themselves far above what an average person would be able to even dream of. This is what we'll be exploring here the heroic armor of the European Renaissance. Armor throughout European history tended to stick closely to whatever the fashions of the clothing were at the time. This is primarily seen in the silhouette of armor. Notice how it changes throughout the centuries. You can see the hem of the clothing and armor change, or the way the legs fit, or how skinny the waist is. And it gets even deeper when the details are revealed. Look how the triangular cutout on the back of doublets in the late 15th century are translated into steel on the back plates of cuirasses, or the square neckline of the early 16th century in gorgets at the time. As a general rule, this kind of armor, while staying fashionable, was perfectly practical, with lots of compound curves to deflect attacks from any angle, and it was meticulously planned out to disperse impacts as efficiently as possible. It was not immune to embellishment, however. Medieval people found many creative and sometimes gaudy ways of staving off planned surfaces, though this sort of decoration rarely affected the actual function of field armor, or armor that was used in battle. But heroic armor is something else. Unlike field armor, it doesn't follow contemporary clothing trends, and it's usually impractical for actual use in battle, whether that's because there's too many spots for a blade to catch, or there are too many costume components, and they outnumber the actual armor. So what's going on with that? Perhaps the artist is trying to show that a depicted person or event took place long ago, or in legend or folktale, as the characters are wearing recognizable pieces of armor mixed with what they might understand as ancient or heroic. Much like when someone today is trying to depict a medieval person, but they dress them up in leather. It's not what medieval people actually wore, but it's what modern people recognize as medieval anyway. A good example of this is a depiction of St. George at the Orson Michel. It does not at all reflect contemporary clothing or armor of the time and region, but instead it features a muscle cuirass and these funky little spalders. Compare this to an actual harness for battle from around the same time period and region, and you can see that it's entirely different. St. George was supposedly a Greek or Roman, so maybe the artist, Donatello, is trying to show off the armor that the Greeks or Romans would have worn, as opposed to just dressing St. George up in contemporary armor, which wasn't uncommon either, especially for St. George. Or, as I said before, he's trying to play off the popular and current idea of what Greeks and Romans looked like at the time. Clearly, Donatello was deliberately trying to convey that the depicted figure was not from this time period, but instead was from a bygone and ancient era, which, of course, he was. This kind of artistic representation is called al antica, and it's not just limited to armor. There may be a dual meaning to this, however. Around the same time period, we start seeing in artwork that all forms of the human form is changing. No longer are people just depicted as faces bundled in mounds of fabric, but they're becoming more defined, more human. One such attribute of this is a display of musculature, which will become more obvious down the line. There's a slight problem though. St. George and his armor are usually hand in hand. There isn't one set or particular type of armor that he normally wears, so usually he's just wearing whatever contemporary armor of the time was. Perhaps Donatello was trying to get in on this burgeoning trend of muscular representation, but since St. George needed his armor, Donatello just made the armor look like muscles. Outstanding move. In the armor world, statues are an incredible resource, but having actual pieces of armor is the best one can do for themselves. A few pieces of heroic ex armor exist, such as the many finely embossed helmets from the Negroli workshops which feature fantastical creatures or give the wearer a full head of hair that looks like it was plucked straight off of a Greek statue, though this is slightly diverging from the point of muscularity. 
As I briefly mentioned before, the depiction of the human form is fairly consistent through the more traditional art world, like in statues and in paintings, and, of course, in this case, all the way into armor design. So when an armor is serving more as an artist, how do they incorporate muscles into armor that otherwise wouldn't? Well, Donatello was already figuring that out in the first decades of the 15th century, and over 100 years later, this particular incredible set of armor was made in 1546 in the Al Antigua style for Philip II. Similarly to Donatello's St. George, this armor sports a muscle cuirass, among other things. This is also, coincidentally, the same time period that the famous Sistine Chapel was painted by Michelangelo, particularly The Last Judgment, where Jesus looked like he's been working out for the last 2,000 years. You can see similar influences at work. But where was this influence coming from, particularly? Movement can be a tough thing to depict in painting, and a lot of different techniques would be used to show it, but during the Renaissance, it was done with muscles. Now, the absolutely shredded figures that we see in art of this time period serve more than just simply displaying the artist's technical skill, which is certainly shown by its own merit. But the body is moved by muscles, and they have very particular shapes and movements when they're flexed, which is something that we tend to pick up on but not always make particular note of in everyday life. By making the figures muscle-bound, the artist can show a sense of movement by tensing particular muscles that would correspond with that particular movement, thereby making the figures look like they're moving while frozen in painting. With armor, however, the motion is supplied by the wearer, who could be at any position at any time, so the tensing of the muscles is a little bit more differently depicted than is given figure in the Sistine Chapel. Because the armor is essentially sculpture in motion, and the user will be in every direction instead of just being perpetually frozen in one position, every muscle on the curious needs to be flexed simultaneously, and the plates need to be expertly articulated in order to accommodate the movement. This gives perhaps a slightly more forced feeling to the overall composition of the armor as an art piece, as there's little innate direction in the, in the, uh, in the entire armor. But just looking at the placement of the rivets and the shaping of the plates, it's easy to imagine how it would collapse and slide over itself, not dissimilarly to the way an actual body might. The armorer that made this, Bartolomeo Campi, was clearly taking notes from other art and incorporating it into the design of the armor for Philip II. It's in a notable Alantica style, directly emulating the Greeks and Romans, and would have been used in parades and similar political functions to directly compare the wearer to the idealized historical figures themselves both as a statement of equity, but also in a physical sense, expertly displayed in the clothing and armor. Much like having a masterfully painted depiction of an ancient event in your hall, this armor is like wearing the painting, saying to everyone that looks at you everything they need to know, I keep up with the art world. I am like the Greeks and Romans, but most importantly, I am rich. It wasn't uncommon for patrons of the art to have themselves painted into historical depictions, and much like that, this harness is armoring the wearer into legend, into the past, and into eternity.